Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Clinton. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Clifford and the meetings team for organising uh, such an outstanding meeting. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be part of such a, a function and uh, may it continue to do well through the annual dinner and tomorrow. Uh, the first part of this session uh, is recognising excellence. Uh, at the same time as we recognise that all members and everyone in this all deliver excellence uh, every day of their working lives. Uh, there are some colleagues who we felt uh, had achieved excellence and an amazing lifetime achievement. We are very grateful to Heart Research UK, uh, a charity of 50 years standing now uh, that was in, set up by um, Mr David Watson, a surgeon at uh, Leeds Killingbeck Hospital and a pioneer himself in the development of the porcine valve and many other innovations. They came to us in 2007 suggesting that they help us recognise the outstanding lifetime achievements of retired colleagues. And in 2008, uh, we started celebrating those achievements. Uh, I would like to list um, so far the, the, the men uh, that have received uh, those lifetime achievements. In 2008, uh, Mr Donald Ross. In 2009, Sir Terence English. In 2010... Mr. Peter Goldstraw. In 2011, Professor Sir Magda Yacoub. In 2014, Mr. Bill Braun. And in 2015, Mr. Marion Ionescu. In turn, these great men have been introduced by other very outstanding colleagues. Uh, Mr. Pat McGee, Mr. Francis Wells, Ms. Deirdre Watson, Professor John Pepper, Mr. David Barron, Mr. Mike Lewis. Uh, today is no exception. Uh, our Lifetime Achievement Award is being uh, introduced by, by Professor Marjan Jahangiri. She has been a very most productive surgeon. She's an outstanding research output and is an outstanding trainer. I'd like you to welcome Professor Jahangiri. Thank you. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Simon Kendall, ladies and gentlemen. I, like many other cardiac surgeons of my generation, acknowledge without hesitation that Mr. Lincoln is our professional parent. He was our teacher, exemplar, and the doctor we will spend the rest of our lives trying to emulate. In our best moments, we look at what we have achieved for a patient and say to ourselves that Mr. Lincoln would have accepted that, that he would not have been displeased. These are private thoughts that do not depend on any great analysis. To explain to others who never saw him work, the nature of that debt, as I do today, is much more difficult. Our specialty has changed greatly. The modern surgeon is expected to achieve better results than our forebears. The mortality, but not unfortunately the morbidity or the quality of our outcomes, is published and compared by our employers and colleagues. We are guided by much better imaging and the support we get now from cardiologists and intensivists enable us to prepare the ground more carefully and to achieve results more consistently. The lessons of Bristol is that every surgeon has to keep up with an ever-rising standard of expectations. We must accept that that was good enough then would not be acceptable today. And that is not new either. Twenty years ago, Mr. Lincoln faced similar problems when he tried to describe the contributions of Brock, home sellers, Tubbs and others the generation of the self-taught. So how then do we explain to our juniors and colleagues how Mr. Lincoln and others of his generation achieved the things on which we depend because they were simply better than we are? Isaac Newton described the problem when he said that if he had seen further, 
It was because he stood on the shoulders of giants. Many of us will always regard Mr. Lincoln as just that person. In 1964, Mr. Lincoln started in cardiac surgery at the Royal Brompton Hospital. At that time, the consultant was Mr. Matt Paneth, who was the first generation of the tort. He stayed at the Brompton for six months as the resident surgical officer. He then went to University College Hospital as general surgical registrar for two years, then to Great Ormond Street Hospital as senior registrar until 1968. In 1968, he went to Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, to work as a research fellow in cardiovascular surgery. This was a non-clinical position. He was awarded the very prestigious Fulbright Scholarship. After a year, he returned to London, working as senior registrar at the Royal Brompton Hospital, the London Chest Hospital, and the National Heart. In 1973, he was appointed as a consultant at the Brompton. Mr. Lincoln says of his own training, it was not possible for anyone to have had better training. All of my mentors, both in UK and US, were first class. It is particularly hard in the case of Mr. Lincoln Incidentally, none of us who were his trainees who revered him would ever have addressed him more familiarly. Because he is now, as he was then, the least flamboyant of men. Private and austere, he was a man of few words, either to his patients or his trainees. That does not mean that he was not capable of a wicked witticism. I remember a difficult case where I unfortunately had to take the patient back five times in seven days for bleeding. And he suggested quietly that, Miss, it would be a good idea if you learned to operate on different patients and not always the same patient. Instead of sending us on professional development courses, medical ethics symposia, learning how to consent, etc., he would, with very few words, instill the message in his trainees. I would like to tell you a story. I did my first aortic valve replacement as an emergency when I was a senior registrar. Very unusually, he was not in the hospital, but he gave me the permission to proceed. The patient did very well. I was very proud. He called me into his office on the first post-operative day. He asked me how the patient was doing, and I said, very well, sir. He said whether I noticed a mild weakness in her left hand, and I said, no, sir. He said, remember, she's someone's grandmother and not your model aeroplane. Since that episode, I telephone or speak with the next of kin of every patient after surgery myself. Although he seemed to me to appear very grand, the epitome of the stylish English gentleman, he was also in some ways very modest and ahead of his time in his respect for colleagues from countries where the facilities were not comparable with those we took for granted in the UK. He pointed out to us that we should have enormous respect for the results they achieve and that some of them plainly had skills from which we should learn. He trained many foreign fellows no fewer than 18, one of whom was Norman Shumway's daughter, who returned to their countries. Each fellow stayed for one year. They all came with limited grants, and Mr. Lincoln supported their stay through his personal funds. Mr. Lincoln was also unusual in his generation in telling us how much attention we should pay to our nursing colleagues. Today, this is conventional among sensible surgeons. But then he was remarkable in seeking out their views and insisting that we did the same. In the theater, he was neat, deft, and confident. His procedures went better and more quickly than those of other surgeons because he prepared carefully and did exactly what he had planned, even if he had to adapt to pathology that was unexpected. I would not say that the tissues parted before his scalpel without bleeding as if from respect. 
but it certainly made it look much easier. All this resulted in very little cancellation of cases. It used to be say, said at the Brompton, you need the initials of CL not to have your cases cancelled. Anyone who puts the name C. Lincoln Cardiac Surgeon into National Public Library and Google Scholar will see how remarkable was his contribution to our understanding of the vulnerability of the pediatric heart and myocardium to the insults associated with surgery and bypass. Although the reader may not realize how little these things were understood at the time. Much of the work that the contributed to our understanding of how to treat congenital heart conditions safely was done by Mr. Lincoln in associations with cardiologists like Dr. Elliot Scheinborn, Dr. Michael Rigby, Professor Andrew Reddington, morphologists like Bob, Professor Bob Anderson and later Yen Ho, anesthetists like Dr. Mike Scallon, Dr. John Simpson, Dr. Charles Gilby. We're very honored they're all here today. These were our leaders and the many younger doctors who work there as trainees look back on it as something like a golden age. You will find that Mr. Lincoln was also the senior author of papers about long-term psychological issues after surgery at a time when these were really not understood. What the record doesn't really show except by implication is that he was a wonderful and generous collaborator who was able to inspire colleagues and his juniors. One day, I received a high magnification Zeiss loop. I suppose like a Bugatti Veyron of the cars. Having at first felt that I had been singled out for praise, I realized that I was not the first or the last of the trainees to receive a present like this. That is why I regard it as a privilege to be able to acknowledge today the debt that I owe to Mr. Lincoln. And in doing so, I know that I'm speaking for colleagues who now lead the profession in many centers here and abroad. People who went before me and after me at the Brompton. Many people who cannot be here today. I know that there must be thousands of patients who are alive and well today because they were lucky enough to be treated by him. When I say thousands, I mean it. When NHS England are saying that cardiac surgeons should treat 125 patients a year, it is worth acknowledging that Mr. Lincoln performed himself three to 400 operations in most years. When I went to see him recently, having written to him on our units headed paper, he looked at the letter in my presence and the list of the surgeons and at the top of it, and asked, what do you all do in the department? We are now painfully learning that high volume surgeons have better outcomes. It was one of the main messages at the last EACS conference. We cannot say in our specialty that there is nothing new under the sun, but we can acknowledge that many of the truths we are painfully relearning for ourselves were already learned for us by Mr. Lincoln and his generation. I am honored to be able to speak for thousands of patients, Mr. Lincoln trainees in UK and abroad, and on behalf of our society. We are proud to have been taught by you, and we owe you more than I can say. On behalf of the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery of Great Britain and Ireland, we honor and thank you, Mr. Lincoln. Thank you very much, uh, Marjan. And now to uh, present the award, if I could uh, introduce uh, Mr. David Watson, who is the founder of Heart Research UK. Mr. Mr. President, 
It is with great pleasure that I present this Lifetime Achievement Award to Chris Lincoln. Chris Lincoln deserves richly this award. He was an outstanding surgeon and the best in his field. And because he was the best, many surgeons of my generation turned to him for help and advice. I do remember very well, having given me some advice, he came to Leeds to do the operation himself. My team were amazed. One of them said to me afterwards, a master surgeon. And they were right. He was indeed a master. I must remind you that Chris was also a pioneer. When he began his career, difficulties were many, and the mortality in some units was high or even horrendous. Bypass or extracorporeal circulation had arrived, but we were very ignorant of its side effects and how to treat them. It was, in fact, in those dark days that I founded the charity to start research on these problems. Fortunately for the future of cardiac surgery, a few greats, such as Chris, emerged to overcome these difficulties, achieve results, and restore the confidence that was so needed. Progress could and did then continue. Mr. President, today's cardiac surgeons with their low mortality, owe a great debt of gratitude to Chris Lincoln. Thank you. If I could ask Mr. Chris Lincoln to come up, please. If I may just say a few words, <clears throat> Mr. President, members, guests, uh, this, this is, of course, a great honour for me and, but most importantly, for all the people I worked with. Anybody can achieve if you've got support and good training, and I had both. Uh, in fact, I, when I heard of this award, I thought it should be re remade into lifetime achievement of a unit. Because one man or woman in a unit is largely irrelevant. But you'll think about that, I hope. Uh, <clears throat> I was fortunate in uh, being taught by s several of the self-taught and many of the first and second generation of the taught. I think I was probably in the third or fourth taught of this uh, train. One of the most impressive things for me in my short career in cardiac surgery was the, the immense strides that were made with materials and methods, in particular suture material. Uh, Proline, for example, atraumatic needles. I mean, <clears throat> can you imagine doing a classical Blaylock shunt 
using muslin or silk with a non-atraumatic needle. When you go back, have a go. Let me know how you get on. And of course, these materials in particular allowed, in my era, the most audacious operations to evolve, the most remarkable of which, unquestionably for me, is the Jatine operation. Uh, one of the great Brazilian surgeons. Uh, <clears throat> I think the most impressive part of my life in cardiac surgery was the camaraderie and networking. That's camaraderie with a capital C. And this started off right at the beginning of cardiac surgery in this country with Pete's Club. Pete, who was Pete? Pete was Peter Jones. And the thoracic surgeons amongst you will know that he was the co-author with Price Thomas for the sleeve resection of the bronchus. And Pete, Pete's club was a club made up of the first of the taught. And they met once a year, formally, not only in the UK, but they had their friends in Europe. And one of the tenets of Pete's club was that they couldn't talk about success. They knew there'd be no progress if people said, look how marvellous I've done this, with this operation or this technique. They knew that you'd only learn if you heard about mistakes. And I think this is very important. And I understand such organizations still happen today. The other thing with really the networking was that uh, there were f annual frequent seminars, uh, most notable of which were the seminars run in the unit in Bergamo in northern Italy. And when a new operation ar arose from some whiz kid surgeon somewhere in the world, uh, the Bergamo unit would invite them to come and do it. And they did it on the te with television, which you could so sit in the audience as you were and watch the man do it. And this meant, of course, that the pain of trying a new operation yourself on the unsuspecting patient was reduced. Because you, you, you had seen the measures to uh, do it the way it should be done. Finally, uh, I must thank the Society again for this wonderful award. And I thank Marjan and David <coughs> for very flattering introductions. <coughs> I thought I would try to uh, finish on a high note. I thank the Brompton Hospital for 25... I, I had a quarter of a century of a glorious life, professional life, at the Brompton Hospital. And I thought you may not know that there's a Brompton cocktail. Cocktail, as in drink. And I researched this. And the Brompton cocktail was devised by Roberts... Pete Roberts was one of the three uh, pioneer lung thoracic surgeons out of the Brompton Hospital. It was Roberts, Tudor Edwards, and Price Thomas. And Roberts designed this analgesic medicine, which he labelled the Brompton cocktail, for use in the misery of terminal pulmonary tuberculosis and the pain and misery of post-thoracotomy pain. And maybe some of you do know what the prompt cocktail is, but I'll read it to you. I got this letter from the pharmacy last week. And the Brompton cocktail is made up of morphine hydrochloride, 15 milligrams, cocaine hydrochloride, 10 milligrams, gin, honey, and chloroform water, 10 mils. So in closing, 
I suggest that when you next ask for a Roberts at the table, also send out for a Brompton cocktail, which you will probably have for lunch or whenever you finish. So here it is. I end on the Brompton cocktail, and <clears throat> I thank the Society once again for this great honour, and uh, I look forward, hopefully, to seeing you in another year. Thank you.